I'm going to start today the same way I started a couple of weeks ago. We began this series called Good Question. And uh, this is what spurred on this whole conversation that uh, I began two weeks ago. Jimmy continued last week with an incredible sermon. If you've not listened to last week, Why Hypocrites, uh, you're missing out. You need to, you need to uh, get to the church website, catch Jimmy's sermon from last Sunday. Uh, Earlier this year, in this 2019, there have been several prominent people in some kind of Christian ministry who walked away from it, who said, I just don't really believe this anymore. Uh, they, they served, they were prominent, they were visible, and they just walked away. They said, I reject this faith. We call that uh, apostasy. It's uh, rege deciding I'm rejecting the faith. I'm rejecting what I claim to have believed previously. And you know, most people don't, don't publicly just, I do hereby declare that I no longer believe. Most people don't do it like that. But a lot of people do it. People once faithful, people once uh, active, people once who professed Christ, they come to find out they were just a longer term uh, shallow soil among the parable of the soils. Didn't really believe, never really. They had a form of religion, a form of godliness, but, but they didn't have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. And uh, the neighborhoods of Collin County are filled with those people today who are sitting at home having walked away from the faith. What stirred this in my heart was uh, a post that got a lot of publicity a few months ago from a prolific worship music writer uh, connected to Hillsong who, uh, who did this Instagram post and uh, he, took it, he took it down a few days later, but uh, I saw it, others saw it, and commented on it. What he said was, I'm losing my faith in Christianity. I think it's just another religion. It's time for some real talk. And this uh, Australian uh, worship leader, he uh, posted, I'm genuinely losing my faith and it doesn't bother me. And he went on to say some other things. And then he said, here's my soapbox moment. And among his comments, one of the things he said was, how can God be love yet send four billion people to a place all because they don't believe? He's talking about hell, obviously. He said, no one talks about it. That's a guy who has never, he's never opened his Bible, apparently. He, he has never gone to church and listened to a sermon, apparently, or not a Bible sermon, because there's a lot of people talking about these topics that he, he spelled out, and they're, they're what we're talking about in the series. No one talks about it. Since the time of Jesus, there has been no religious topic maybe more talked about and more uncomfortable to talk about than hell. And this is really just a doctrine of hell today. So what does the Bible teach about hell? And I love that sentence. What does the Bible teach about hell? Because it has, you have to acknowledge in this conversation everything that we, I'm going to say about hell is because the Bible says it about hell. Now, here's the deal. You may not like what the Bible says about hell. You may not agree with what the Bible says about hell. You may not believe what the Bible says about hell. But the one thing you cannot do is say the Bible doesn't talk about hell. And you've done painted yourself into a corner on this one. To deny hell is to deny the Bible. Whether you think it's fair, truthful, logical, you like it or don't like it, it's, it's in there. Most people you're going to talk to about any spiritual topic, and we've had plenty of gospel conversations in the last few years in our community. We've had these conversations over and over again. Well, here's how I think it works. Here's my opinion about how God does things, or, how, or who God is, or what God is like. Or here's, here's what somebody told me once, and so I am going with that. And... In other words, I'm just making stuff up. 
I have created a religion in my own image that fits me and my life and my choices. I just made it up. And that's most of what you're going to hear. There's no authority to those statements, just opinions. Uh, and that's where most people's views about God, about uh, eternity, end up coming from, is just opinions. Here's what's different when, when, because of who we have chosen to be as a church. Here's what's different when we talk about the topic, uh, a topic like hell. We believe the Bible is the word of God. Some people will tell you the Bible contains the word of God. That's just sorry. That didn't mean anything. That means the Bible means whatever you want it to mean. And that's how most people, by the way, most churches in these United States of America who it says something, there's a cross on a steeple, there's a, a sign that we are Christian. I'm telling you, the overwhelming majority of them are going to say, ultimately, the Bible contains the Word of God. But you know, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says the Bible is the very Word of God. And it's true. And we're not just playing religious games. We're not putting blind faith in the Bible. We talked about this two weeks ago. The Bible is, is trustworthy. It has credibility that's been attacked but never undermined it's always proven to be true in the things that it says and people just say and goodness I preached the sermon two weeks ago about the Bible and I talked about the, the things people say about the Bible and the famous history channel you know it also gives you finding Bigfoot among its history and on that Sunday I go home and I turn on my TV and my goodness the history channel has got a thing about the books that the Bible kept out. Christians kept out of the Bible. And uh, they're just saying, well, obviously this book was just kept out for no particular reason. Oh, well, I could give you a hundred reasons why that, bio, that book was kept out of the Bible. It's a bag of nuts. It came a thousand years after Jesus. One of them came a thousand years after the New Testament period, the first century. There's all kinds of reasons it was kept out. But they, oh, obviously, here, and they just throw things out with no authority behind them. Here, the Bible is our authority. There are a lot of books that were going to deny hell. Some embrace, uh, by the way, if you deny hell, what you found, you found uh, a, a person, a church, or a denomination that has embraced universalism, which is the most popular false teaching in our country. Everybody's going to be okay doesn't make any difference what you believe, if you believe. If you choose not to believe, everybody's going to end up at the same place in the same way with the same thing if they believe in some afterlife. Some consider hell to be the invention of a wild-eyed prophet like myself. Somebody obsessed with the wrath of God. They argue that Christians should, should take the higher road of Christ's love. And let's just said my, my little testimony to, to the kids a moment ago. Christ's love was overwhelming for me because of what he did at the cross. But I recognized if I didn't respond to that, I would go to hell for eternity. God is a God of grace and love. God is a God of judgment and justice. And we're going to talk about that and why we, for whatever reason, we don't want to do it with our eternal soul, but we want justice and judgment everywhere else when there's a wrong in the world. This perspective overlooks a a conspicuous reality. And this is, uh, this is how to have this conversation with anybody anywhere. In the Bible, Jesus said more about hell than anybody else. Jesus said more about hell than anybody else. So to den and I don't, I don't want to make light of what I'm about to say. I don't want you just to pass it by easily. But I want this to be really clear. If you deny hell, you have denied Jesus. You can't have that both ways. You can't say Jesus is wrong and Jesus is my Savior. You, you can't say Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, but Jesus is going to take me to heaven when I die. To deny the existence of hell is to deny the Savior who can save you from hell. To deny hell is to deny Jesus and what Jesus said and what Jesus believed. Hell is the most unpopular topic in the Bible, certainly, but it is there. And it's there for a reason. 
To reject what the Bible says about hell is to abandon the source of authority for everything else the Christian faith teaches. You have undermined the scriptures. And this goes back to two weeks ago. You are denying the authority of scripture, which means the Christian faith is whatever I want it to be. It's whatever I want to believe. It's however I want to live. It's, I have created an, an, a religion in my own image, and I'm going to do whatever I please, and God just ought to be glad he gets anything from me. To believe in hell is to reject, to not believe in hell, to reject hell is to reject Jesus, and you can't overlook that truth. I've shared this before, and it's even more true than the first time I shared it decades ago, but when a church, when a person... When a denomination, by the way, for those of you heading off to college, those of you who are college students, you want to evaluate a church, those of you who are visiting churches, you want to evaluate a church, just ask that one question. What do you teach about hell here? What do you believe about hell? It's the ultimate clarifier. Because if that one falls, first of all, they don't believe in the authority of the Bible. They're also going to be universalists. They're also going to quickly, because there's, there's a set of dominoes that start to fall. And we've seen this in religious institutions. We've seen this in institutions of higher learning across our country, in our own state, where when you deny hell, you've denied the scriptures. And here's what happens next. All those miracles start going away. That's just the way ancient people tried to explain things. The virgin birth goes away. There's a whole set of of doctrinal issues that crumble quickly. Hell is always the first one to go, so you can always find uh, what kind of church you're in based on that one doctrine. Jesus, the only way of salvation. All those begin to go away when the doctrine of hell is discarded. And what you end up with, you end up with universalism and you end up with the social gospel. The social gospel is the most common gospel. It's a false gospel. It's not good news at all. It's works-based. It says, we're going to care about people, and we're going to be nice, and we're going to do good things in the community. Not that different than any other social or service club would do in the community. because There's nothing eternal about us, but that's what we do, and that describes most of the churches across our land. Now, hell is not just about hell. It's not that you can say, I'm going to cherry pick this thing and I'm going to drop this doctrine. I'm going to keep these others and nothing is damaged. Because here's the thing about this, this truth, biblical truth about hell. It's woven into the fabric of Christian. And I'm talking about biblical Christian truth because Christian doesn't mean anything in our country. That word is meaningless because it's defined uh, subjectively by everybody. Everybody's going to be a Christian Everybody's going to describe themselves as a Christian, but they don't mean a biblical Christian. What the Bible teaches about the authority of Scripture, the character of God, the consequences of sin, the redemptive work of Christ, the message of the gospel, the mission of the church, the reality of the afterlife, all these doctrines are wrapped up together. And when you discard the doctrine of hell, you've done damage to all those other biblical truths. You have altered the core meaning of God's word. It's essential that we seek a biblical understanding of the doctrine of hell. And the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ is God's response to the bad news of hell. The eternal punishment for personal sin. Saving faith in the finished work of Christ at the cross guarantees the hope of heaven. But without Christ... Every person would su without Christ would suffer the torments of God's holy wrath because he is a holy God, that wrath against sin in hell forever. I want to read a story Jesus told about this, this topic. And it comes from Luke 16, verse 19. And Jesus says, There was a rich man, who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's side. 
The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received good things, just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here while you're in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you. So that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Father, he said, then I beg you to send him to my father's house because I have five brothers. To warn them that they won't also come to this place of torment. We got this conversation in staff meeting the other day that uh, in hell everybody's an evangelist. Everybody wants people to know about Jesus. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. No, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. But he told them, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. There's some fundamental truths about hell that uh, we learn from God's word. This is the first one, and uh, you have a program there. Hell is real. Hell is a real place. It's not a figurative, imaginary place, but a real place. Mentioned 23 times in the New Testament, 15 times by Jesus himself. Jesus called it a place of torment. Now, survey work, we ask Americans, so... Do you have any expectation that you might have a first-hand experience with hell at the point of your death? And one half of 1% of Americans say, uh, are willing to say out loud, oh, yeah, sure, probably. But our ignorance, our deceit, deceived spirits do not change the fact that hell is real. God's Word describes hell as fire. Uh, verse 24. Jesus said, so it will be at the end of the age, the angels will go out separate separate the evil people from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jude 7 calls it the punishment of eternal fire. There God's enemies tormented with fire and sulfur in the sight of the holy angels and the sight of the lamb and the smoke of the torment will go up forever. Hell is the lake of fire. In another description, uh, this one taken from the, the, there was a trash heap that burned uh, in the valley just outside of Jerusalem. You go out the dung gate. We talked about this on Wednesday night in our tour of Israel a few weeks ago. Go out the dung gate and there, there was a, just, that was the trash dump and it was always burning. And they called it Gehenna. The valley of Hinnom uh, is the valley uh, that became the trash heap that Jesus used that description for hell. Gehenna, their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Hell is called darkness too. This fire is a different kind of fire than fire that brings light. This fire carries darkness. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Most interpreters see the descriptions as intentionally symbolic. We talk about hell in the Bible. Same as when we talk about heaven. How do you describe indescribable things that we cannot even begin to imagine? You get word pictures and you, you stack those up. But the descriptions describe a literal place, a reality. Worst of all, hell is a separation from God and all that he represents in his character. Remember Jesus' warning. I'll announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. This separation is a permanent separation. And don't miss the point. Hell is terrible. And what Jesus does when he talks about hell is he uses the worst images. He can, he can use his language on this earth to describe it uh, the worst he could find. And the point is you do not want to go there and you don't want anybody you care about to go there to be absent from God, from all that is good, from uh, all e- for all eternity. That is hell. 
If, uh, if asked why I believe hell is a real place, it's a simple answer. I believe hell is a real place. It's a reality because Jesus did. That answers a lot of questions. Because Jesus did. Jesus clearly understood hell to be a real place. He talked about hell literally. He talked about it regularly. He talked about it dramatically. Jesus does say more about hell by far than he does about heaven. In our country... Again, survey work, it's an overwhelming majority believe in heaven. Small minority even believe in hell anymore. But the Bible doesn't give us the option to believe in one and deny the other. Hell is as real as heaven. Jesus has the most to say about hell in the Bible. And if you can somehow disprove or discredit what Jesus says about hell, then you don't have a leg to stand on on anything else Jesus says. Because if what Jesus says is elective, which for most people it is, I choose to believe it. This part, I don't believe that part. This gets in my business. This makes me uncomfortable. And we're choosing what we do and don't believe from God's word. We've undermined Jesus himself. What the Bible says about God, sin, salvation, heaven, eternity, or anything else. But there, here's the good news. Don't miss this. You don't have to guess, and I'm so tired of hearing stories and having conversations with people who are guessing what God is like and guessing about what God, God does. You know, you know why you don't have to do that? He wrote a book. He wrote a book. God wrote a book, and he gave it to us. You don't have to guess. It's all spelled out. It's so clear, and it is glorious. To deny what the Bible teaches about hell is not to deny hell. It's to deny the Bible. And that's where this gets so messy. The Bible intentionally paints itself into a corner. It does not contain the word of God. It is the word of God. And it's an all or nothing proposition. It is God breathed according to 2 Timothy 3.16. It's all true. And if only selected parts of it are true. Actually God's word. None of it is God's word. You knock down the door of hell. You knock down anything Christian faith and can pack it up and head on home hell is real hell is horrible many people speak of going through difficult circumstances and please don't ever say this to me because I'll call you on it I hope you'll call one another on it but what do people say I'm just going through th this has been so hard I'm just it, this is just going I'm just going through hell right now you heard that statement I'm just going through hell right now it's an understandable comparison because hell is, is the strongest word you can use to describe problems, hardships, and affliction. Hell's as bad as it gets, so that's understandable, but it is inappropriate to describe your troubles as hell ever because it minimizes hell so severely. It trivializes the reality of hell. Nothing a person suffers in this life can legitimately be compared to the horrors of hell. In a lot of, uh, you see it in cartoons, you see it in secular media, you see it how people talk about the topic. Hell is depicted as just the mother of all parties. Man, that's where I'm just going to be with all my friends and we're just going to party in hell. And heaven is presumed to be boring because they, people have also never read what the Bible says about heaven being a party. What Jesus said about heaven being a party. It's like the wedding feast. But hell is where they think where the real celebration takes place. That's wishful thinking. Scripture goes out of its way to say there is nothing about hell that's fun, enjoyable, positive. It's a horrible place, and it is a place of inescapable torment for unrepentant and thus unforgiven sinners. Hell is a, and this is how it worked in my heart, Hell is a scare tactic of the sovereign grace of God. The Bible traces the horrors of hell to scare you out of your sins, that you would run to the grace and the love of Jesus Christ in faith, all in faith, and repentance, shame, and conviction of sin. That ought to motivate Christians too to share the gospel because I care too much about the people around me who are far from God. The people that you're going to see Thanksgiving and Christmas when your families gather. 
You don't want anybody to spend eternity in hell. Everybody around the world. That's why we go, that's why we have a team in Guatemala this week. Because we think everybody in the world needs to know about Jesus. Hell is real. Hell is horrible. Hell is also eternal. In the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus presents hell as a real place, a horrible place, and he makes it clear there is no exit strategy from hell. And that freaks people out. And we have large groups of people around the world, different groups that, and individuals who say, yeah, that just doesn't make sense to me. There's got to be a way out. There's got, you can pray them out. You can baptize on their behalf. There's something else you can do to, to change what the Bible says is the answer to that. To change what the Bible says. Not so. Do not dismiss what Jesus teaches about hell in this parable just because it's a parable. These teaching stories of Jesus, one of the things about them, and I say this because people try to do it this way, oh, well, that's just a parable. Jesus wasn't teaching. He was just telling a story. Like Jesus tells random stories for no reason. Like Jesus, in their parables, he makes up characters and scenarios and dialogue, but he doesn't make up truth. The parable of the Good Samaritan tells a story about the, what happened on the Jericho Road. But there really was a Jericho Road, a real place, a real, a real location on a map. And I'm telling you, there's a real place on the map called hell. When the rich man went to hell, he cried out for deliverance from his torment. And uh, the response of heaven... Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot. Neither can those from there cross over to us. Again, if you think it's, you think it's just a short term, you, you think it's just a cleansing experience, you think that there's a way out, it's eternal according to the word of God and you can't keep denying the word of God and claim to be a follower of Christ. In the parable of the sheep and goats, Jesus concludes, depart from me you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Something else about, about hell, it wasn't created for people. It was created for the devil and his angels. It's an otherworldly, ungodly, horrible, horrible place. Jesus refers to hell as eternal punishment. And when he talks about that, eternal punishment, he's, he's making, he also makes a contrast. Eternal punishment, eternal life. Hell is forever, and heaven is forever. And he uses the same words to describe both. A lot of people believe in eternal heaven. They just don't want to believe in an eternal hell. But either it's eternal life, or it's eternal punishment in hell. Jesus teaches. The Bible declares. Okay. I know this is a lot for you to absorb on a Sunday. It's a lot for me to have to do, and I have to do it again. But I'm telling you, hell's real, hell's horrible, hell's eternal, but, but you guys have hung in with me. I appreciate that. You've, you've made it to here. So I have a bonus truth for you. Hell is avoidable. Fully avoidable. Hell is, God is holy, but His holiness demands that there be a punishment for sin. Eternal separation from Him. The eternal death, not uh, ceasing to exist, but to exist in a terrible fate. Jesus said, so do not be amazed at this, because the time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear His voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, and those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of condemnation. Every sin is going to be paid for, because God is just. I want Him to be just. That's His character, to be just. Every sin is going to be paid for. And it's either going to be paid for by you're going to spend eternity in hell. Or it's going to be paid for by your faith in Christ who paid for your sin at the cross. Forgiveness, new life, and eternal hope can be yours today. But ignoring the doctrine of hell diminishes the depravity of our sinful nature. And that's exactly how this works. People do not want to think they're that bad. They don't want to think that they're really, they really have a problem. They don't want to think that they have to rely on a Savior to save them. They think they can do it themselves, that we can earn it, we can deserve it, we can be good enough, we can 
weigh the scales 51% of the good when we die and we'll be okay if there's no place of eternal punishment for the sins of those who reject Christ then there's no reason for the cross God would have found a different way to do it than the cross something so extreme if there was a different way to do it the literal existence of hell is an integral part of God's plan as revealed in God's word. You hear lots of people say, well, a loving God would not send people to a horrible hell. And a good response would be uh, maybe Acts 17, 31. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man. He's talking about Jesus. He has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Most people's trouble with uh, this doctrine is that they don't, they don't want to think of God as judge, that God is going to actually hold us to account, that the things in this book, God actually takes seriously. When we take it as quite elective and sort of a cafeteria approach with the parts we like, the parts we don't like, but the Bible says it over and over and over again. Part of our aversion to judgment is we're used to people doing it badly. People are vindictive. People are mean-spirited in how they do it. And so we say, well, you know, judge not lest ye be judged. Well, God is a perfect judge because he is the creator. He set the agenda. He sets the rules. And his character is at stake. And God's judgment is an expression of his love. His love for what is good and what is right can't pretend that it's okay for sin to prosper, for sin to carry forward, for sin not to be confronted with justice. You say, oh, no, no, no. It should all be about forgiveness all the time. You, drive, you go out to your car in the parking lot today and you see that somebody scraped your car pulling out of the spot next to you and didn't leave a note, you want justice. You want us to go look at the cameras and see if we can find evidence of what somebody did to your car. We love justice. Except when it comes to us. God's justice is so even and so clear. And so we don't want a judgeless world. Neither can we embrace God who does not judge. How about this parable? Picture yourself. You're in an emergency room. You have a serious illness. The doctor explains the illness is 100% fatal unless you are treated with the antidote, which is, a, which is an injection, a shot. If you get the shot, the cure for your 100% fatal illness is 100% recovery. Success rate, perfect. So by saying this, what the doctor has said to you is, well, I think I'm going to treat this with my essential oils instead. I'm going to treat this uh, with an exercise program and a better diet. I don't like shots. Shots hurt. Doctor's just saying, I don't care what your opinion is about the treatment. This is what fixes it. Your, your feelings about shots and treatment is irrelevant. This particular disease has a particular uh, remedy and it has to be given in a particular way. You do it or you die. Now, because this illness is so serious, and because there's only one cure, it's really important that you go some, to somebody that has it. You go to a doctor that's going to, that knows what they're doing, what they're talking about. No, nobody has a heart attack, and they go to a doctor who would say, well, it's all heart problems, huh? And you walk out of the office with a cast on your leg, thinking that... Well, well, you know, I guess he's a doctor. He must know. No, I don't think he knows. You have to have the right treatment no matter how much you don't like it or how painful it is or how offensive it is to you. You don't go shopping for the treatment that you like best. The cure is the cure. End of story. If we understand the Christian faith, biblical Christianity, because Christian doesn't mean much, biblical Christian faith, correctly we see it as the antidote. It's not a lifestyle choice. It's not a part of a well-balanced religious diet. 
Jesus is not like the cherry flavored cough syrup that's just different from the lemon flavored Buddha cough syrup, uh, the strawberry flavored Mohammed cough syrup. Christianity has some challenges. It can be difficult. There are inconveniences. There are sacrifices to be made. It may not be what the culture says is acceptable and, and uh, is the, the cool thing to do. It might be offensive to some people. And most of us, honestly, we'd rather treat this whole thing of the Christian faith in a cafeteria approach, a supermarket approach, where we just end up saying, I'll take a little of this and a little of that, a little of this, and I'm going to live the life that mostly just affirms whatever I was planning to do anyway. I'm going to live the way I want to live, and this book has no bearing on that. God's truth has no bearing on my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. But we can't live that way because we need the truth. And God has provided truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Sin is willful. Sin is a bigger deal than we think. Sin is a willful opposition to Almighty God. Shaking a, fist, a defiant fist in the face of the creator, redeemer, and king of the universe. In this whole story, there is something unfair about this whole deal. You know what it is? That we don't all go to hell. That's what's weird about this story. It's exactly what we deserve. Every one of us deserves hell for eternity. What's odd is that God in his grace has made a way... He absorbed what justice demanded when Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sin. And he offers this gift to us, a bunch of sinners. Now, this is uh, the most dangerous of the myths about hell. A lot of people, oh yeah, I believe in hell. Who's going to be in hell? Really bad people. Really bad people. Tell me about those people. Well, you know, it's the, you know, it's the serial killers. It's, uh, it's your Charles Manson type, or it, it's your Hitler. It, we all, everybody has their list of the people they think are the really bad people. And uh, when we say that, uh, uh, in my conversations with people, yeah, who's going to be in hell? Bad people. And with that, here's what it means. Other people. That's the other people. That's just people that aren't me, because I'm not one of those bad people. Oh, I'm not perfect, but, you know, I'm more of a garden variety center. Not too bad, not too extreme. The one point of agreement we should have with the myth, hell is for bad people, is this. We are all the bad people. Jesus said, no one is good but God. Paul wrote, no one is righteous. All have turned from God and become worthless. What we all deserve is eternal punishment, separation from God, and an eternal hell. And, you know, we, and I know you can look at it and go, well, this person, but look at, look at how extreme their sin was. Look, look at how off the charts they are comparatively. But one sin against a perfect holy God is much, much more rebellious and evil and dark than we like to let on. But God has graciously provided a cure for the problem. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's asking, what are you waiting for? Why are you playing a game? Why are you substituting for this incredible gift of salvation through Jesus Christ? Why would you want to try to do it a different way? Here's the kind of God we're talking about. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know, do you know that if you died today, do you know that you would go to heaven? Do you know your sin has been forgiven? I had this conversation last week. Somebody in a hospital bed. I said, you know, if it was me in the bed instead of you, I sure I want somebody, regardless of what I've done or where I've been in my life, to ask me the same question. 
you're going to die. And you know you're going to die. Do you know without a doubt your sin's forgiven? Do you know without a doubt that if you died today, you'd spend eternity in heaven? Why would you wonder about it? Why would you want to play a game of chance with your eternal soul? I'm going to do something I do not do very often. I'd like for all of you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I know that's hard for you because some of you just don't like to follow rules. Bow your heads, close your eyes. And I want to ask this question. I don't want anybody looking around. I'm going to look around because I want to encourage you in this. But I don't, I don't want you to leave without getting this settled. If, if you say, today, you know what? I've been baptized. You know, I've walked an aisle. I've, I've prayed a prayer. I don't, but I don't know for sure today. And I want to know today. I want to know my sin is forgiven. Know I belong to Jesus. Just lift your hand up and say, hey, Chad, pray for me today. I want to, I want to know. I just want to have this settled. Raise your hand, drop it back down. Anybody? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Just to know. Just to know. All right. I want to lead you in that kind of prayer. And as I pray this out loud, maybe you just pray it silently, but it has to be your heart just to settle this. I just want you to know. Maybe you'd pray. Dear God, thank you that you love me. A sinner. I know I can't save myself. And I know that my sin has destined me for hell. I want to turn from my sin. Today I turn my life to Jesus Christ completely. I believe what Jesus did at the cross paid for my sin. I believe when he was raised from the dead, it showed the work was complete. Come into my life, Jesus. Wash away my sins. I want to follow you as the king of my life for the rest of my days. Thank you for this amazing gift. In Jesus' name. Amen.